Hi everybody, this is our Katie Freckman, a New York City personal injury trial attorney, and today we're doing a case analysis, a recent verdict that just came down a few weeks ago, even a few days ago, and it's a monster verdict, really big, and it has a lot of interesting concepts about how a plaintiff's attorney can prepare and present their case in the best light possible to maximize the result for his or her client. And so let's talk about this case. This was a case where a U-Haul, Silverado Chevy U-Haul, had a head-on collision with another vehicle, which was a Toyota. And one individual, the driver of the Toyota, his life would never be the same. He had two children, two boys, I believe, and they were seven and eight years old uh, at the time of trial and they were five and six years old at the time of the crash. The kids had very minor injuries, but the father had serious injuries. And what happened was the case had a lot of bad facts, mostly on the issue of damages. Bad fact number one was that the plaintiff, his name I believe was Mr. Roman, Mr. Roman, he weighed 500 pounds, so he was morbidly obese, and every medical record made that clear. So that was a really bad fact. The other issue was that he had multiple domestic violence felony convictions against him, and he actually served time in jail four times. He had four different stints in jail, and now a fifth conviction for domestic violence, and the defense was going to bring that up against him. So that was a very bad fact as well. So this individual, he lived in a really small, cramped apartment with the two boys, and um, it was almost like a slum-like condition. And uh, when you went in there, there was a smell of marijuana and just general neglect and disrepair, very cramped. And so the lawyer that handled this case, he was actually, there was a one lawyer that handled the case for many years. And then right before trial, he called another lawyer and he kind of brought the other lawyer in to help him, and they did the trial together. So the lawyer that he called in was actually a lawyer that's very good. He 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 does a lot of the uh, trial work, trial lawyers, college workshops, and he teaches other lawyers. He was a, f a former, I believe, uh, Marine. He served in the Army and the Marines, and he's a, he's a very good lawyer. I actually worked with him when I went out to the Trial Lawyers College in Montana. I, I watched some of his lectures and I watched some of his lectures on cross-examination. He's very good. So basically, this lawyer got the case only two weeks before the trial. And when he got that case, what he spent in those two weeks doing, instead of like, you know, spending them combing through the medical records or doing things like that, what he actually spent the two weeks doing is every day he would go and he would visit the client. He would go and he would just sit outside his door, they would sit, he would sit on a motorized scooter, the client, because he's so injured and so uh, obese. And then they would um, basically spend time every day uh, and they would go to the park and they just talked and he would get to know him. And so the injuries that this particular individual sustained included a comminuted tibial plateau fracture of the left knee. So comminuted means that it's broken into pieces, it's shattered and the tibial plateau of the knee is a very, you know, basically a very serious um, area. That's a very serious fracture. Then he had a dislocated right elbow. He had torn ligaments, a fracture of the C7 spinous process, and a head laceration. So he had serious injuries. And so he needed a surgery known as an open reduction internal fixation to fix the injury to his elbow they had to reattach ligaments, and they had, I believe, also a surgery for the knee, and they had to put a lot of the pieces back together, and they used three plates and 18 screws. And so the other thing the lawyer did was, in addition to speaking with the client, he spoke with the family members, the friends, the circle of friends, community, people, you know, people in his life, people in, in his life. And he found out that the ex-wife's sister, her name was Rosa, was also very friendly with the plaintiff. And she actually explained a lot of what had happened, that the that her sister, the wife, the ex-wife, was actually abusive and because she had mental health disorders. And that's why, and she kept, you know, getting him into trouble with family court and even criminal court. But it but ultimately he 
was a good person. He actually got custody of the kids. So they explained that, that situation. And then <clears throat> there was another issue because after the open reduction internal fixation, the screw re removal surgery, after that surgery, it caused a really bad infection known as osteomyelitis, which is an infection of the bone and actually the blood, the blood gets infected. That's incurable infection in the bone. It's very serious. The only way to really treat it is with antibiotics. So it gets flares up and you put antibiotics and then it's supposed to be controlled, but it's not, it can't be cured. And so he had to have surgery uh, for that. And, um, and then the medical records, what they, what the doctors actually wrote in the medical records was also a really bad fact. What they wrote is that the patient acted against medical advice because he put weight on his leg after the surgery. And that's why it led to the infection and the osteomyelitis because he was told not to do that. But the lawyer actually thought that that was the doctor just protecting themselves from medical negligence because you'll see there was no way to avoid that because of the injuries. So let's talk about the trial. What happened was the trial was done out in California, I believe in Lancaster, California. And the first thing was that before the trial even started, the defense was asking for motions in limine and certain uh, jury instructions to be read to the jury. And one of those instructions was that um, if the patient did not follow medical advice, then the patient is negligent, right? Or at least gets a percentage of the negligence. So that, that's something that they asked for. And that's really like improper. They shouldn't have gotten it. But the judge was a former, uh, he was not a civil, he was army JAG judge. And he's done a few civil trials, but he wasn't familiar with civil practice. Because you never know what kind of judge you're going to get. Sometimes you get a judge that's moved in from like family court or moved in from criminal court. And they just don't know the uh, personal injury rules. And then you just have to roll with the punches, right? Because they could be making bad rulings like this judge. And, and then he actually let that in. So that should not have come in, but that's something that happened. And then voir dire, that's jury selection. And what happened with voir dire is the judge said, look, all of these lawyers just talk to like 45 people all at once. And you're only allowed to use numbers. You're not allowed to address the jurors by name, just use numbers. So it was very hard to understand, you know, who was saying what and keeping track, because that's very important too. Like when I do the voir dire, what I like to do is I, I'm asking the questions, let's say, but another lawyer may be sitting next to me and they'll be taking notes. Then you review the notes and say, hey, because you can't be asking the questions and engaging with the jurors and at the same time remembering who, you know, who said what. And we usually just question, let's say, you know, 15, 20 people at a time. And then we only have to select eight jurors. They were questioning 45 people and they only had numbers, like you're number 37, you're number 15. And they're supposed to, you know, it's very hard to keep track. So, um, so this is an interesting point that happened during voir dire. What happened was um, in voir dire, the lawyer, he focused on this concept of extreme brutal honesty, like, you know, just the raw truth. And he went through a few topics. And the topics include, he even created like a little PowerPoint presentation. I guess it was like an image for each topic. And the topics were bias, uh, civil lawsuits, just what people think about civil lawsuits, personal injury lawsuits, the civil justice system, okay? Uh, money damages, just the idea of compensation, money damages, and obesity, being overweight or being obese. And from the outset, the defense, they had five or six lawyers. They had jury consultants there with them. They had investigators. They had a whole portfolio of pictures uh, on each one of the jurors. And they were a little bit confused by the plaintiff, by what the plaintiff was doing. And the plaintiff just asked them, what does extreme brutal honesty mean to you? And he, he listened to the jurors. He kind of interacted with them. He wasn't, he didn't have any kind of agenda. You know, he was just asking them, what does it mean to you? And he was truly listening. Okay, let me really listen to what you have to say. And then he was, he was clear that he was listening because he was asking follow-up questions. Okay, why do you feel that way? Okay, how about you? Do you agree with Mr. Smith? And he was just, you know, engaging the jury. And then he pivoted to those topics that we just went through, the bias of the lawsuits, obesity, money damages. And so during the voir dire, some of the jurors said they could not be fair to the corporation, to U-Haul, because liability was already admitted. 
So they said, look, if the U-Haul is already admitting liability, then obviously they're at fault. So I feel like they have to pay and I can't really be fair to them. I feel like I wouldn't be fair to them. So instead of like, say, arguing with the jurors or asking them to be, uh, you know, instead of doing anything like that, which a lot of people would do, right? Because you want those jurors. Hey, if you can't be fair to my enemy, well, then I want you, right? You're, you're my friend. But what he did was he said, look, I will agree to excuse these jurors for cause because, and for cause means because they cannot be fair, right? Because for cause you have unlimited challenges. If somebody can't be fair, they get excluded. And then preemptory in New York, you only have two challenges, uh, two preemptories. Uh, you know, it's limited. That's for any reason. But here he said, I'll agree to get rid of all these jurors that can't be fair to the defendant for cause, right? And so the defense were just scratching their head. They're like, well, what is this guy doing? How come he's, you know, basically being so... And the reason he did that was because he wanted to build credibility, right? He wanted to say, look, I'm really here for the truth. I'm really here to get at the truth. I'm not here to, you know, to ask for a juror that can't be fair and I want them to give me a lot of money. That's not what I'm here for. I, I agree to kick out all the jurors that are bad for the defense. So that was a really big point. And I think that really showed the rest of the panel, because everyone's there, right, all at once, all 45 people. The rest of them were like, wow, this guy is the real deal. He's, he's being honest. He's being credible. So that really helped. And the defense, their voir dire was a little bit different. They actually agreed. They said, okay, if you're going to get rid of all these jurors that are bad for us, then we'll get rid of a few jurors maybe that are bad for you, but, or, or, you know, that are, bad, that are bad in general. But then they didn't hold up their bargain, you know. They, they only agreed to, let's say, get rid of two, but then the other three, they said, no, we're going to keep those. And then at the end, what they did was, um, so he got rid of a lot of the jurors based on challenges for cause. And then maybe he used just like one preemptory challenge because the jurors said the concept of damages and uh, putting money on an injury was not something that they could do. So he got rid of that juror. And then the defense began to exercise all their preemptories, whatever they had. And it was almost like a scorched earth. They started getting rid of people for, for no good and no valid reason. And so I think that made them look bad. And so in opening statement, they were talking about um, the, just the case. They were talking about a few issues. One of the things the defendants did in opening statement, this is interesting, was they said, look, this U-Haul, this particular U-Haul uh, branch was founded by a veteran and they showed the veteran like in his, um, you know, uh, uniform. And they said that it's a responsible company. The reason the driver was even on the road was because he was going to open up a new dealership, a new U-Haul dealership, and that was going to bring jobs to the community. So what they're doing by saying all this is they're just like asking for sympathy, but not sympathy for the injured uh, plaintiff, sympathy for the defendant, right? So then the witness examination, uh, they, it came out that uh, Mr. You know, Mr. Roman was really, really injured. They talked about his life, his personality before the injury, the terrible disability that he had, all the struggles, everything he had to overcome. And then um, they talked about even how disabling the injury was. The injury was so disabling that one of his sons, the youngest son, who was only like I think seven years old, he would have to help wipe his father after the father used the bathroom because he was just so injured, he couldn't do anything. And then uh, they had an expert, a doctor, and the plaintiff's lawyer actually asked the doctor not to be an advocate, right? Because you don't necessarily want these doctors to be advocates because then they're not completely fair, neutral, and impartial to both sides, right? They're like advocating for you. So he said, look, don't be an advocate, just be like a teacher. Go in there and be like a teacher, explain to us all this medicine. And he even said, can you think of a couple of drawings that you could use and you could actually draw them, you know, on a, I'll just get a butcher paper, like a big piece of white paper, I'll put it up there and you'll draw it in front of the jury. And that's what he did. He came up with four drawings and that was really interesting for the jury and it kept them engaged. And the other thing he did was he actually had the client go up there during the doctor's testimony. And so the doctor, his name was Dr. Smith, he actually hunched over the plaintiff, because the plaintiff's a big guy, 500 pounds, he hunched over the plaintiff 
and he was examining him and diagnosing and explaining, okay, here's the knee, this is where the infection was, and showing the jury, and the jury actually got out of the box, and they were moving around so they could see, and they were really looking, and again, he was pointing to touching the leg, the site of the infection, the site of the injury, explaining bacteria is still present, but it's currently under control because of the antibiotics, but then it could come back, that's how the osteomyelitis works, and this was really important uh, and very interesting and engaging. So then, um, basically, yeah, and then, and then basically the point about him not following medical advice, the way that they handled that was they said, look, it was impossible to follow that advice because U-Haul, the crash was so bad that U-Haul dislocated his elbow, tore his ligaments in his right arm, and that made it impossible for him to use a walker so how could he put weight? He had to put weight on that leg. It was impossible for him not to put leg on that on that weight. And so, and then they talked about the future of the likelihood that that leg would have to be amputated in the future. And they said that's a medical uh, probability, very high medical probability that it's that's likely. That's, that was his opinion. So then closing arguments came, and in closing arguments, basically they just talked about, you know, they said, look. He brought up that thing again. He said Look, that that was just a way to ask you for sympathy because do you really think that this particular driver was there to open up a new store to create jobs? No, he was just he was just driving. That's not why he was there. The, the, the only reason they said that was because they wanted you to um, you know be sympathetic towards them. And the people pretty much um, agreed. The jurors were shaking their head and, uh, and then... Um, <clears throat> They talked about the concept of, of damages verdicts. And in the closing, the plaintiff's lawyer, ultimately, he asked the jury, he said, look, for this kind of injury, this kind of debilitating disability permanent injury, what I think is fair is 500000 per year was reasonable for every year of the past and future. And so he also asked for, it turned out to be like $1.75 million for the past, and 15.8 million for the future. And um, that's what he asked for. And I think the total verdict that the jury ended up allowing for in the trial was 21 million. So a very high verdict, very serious uh, verdict. And the highest offer for all three plaintiffs before the trial was 2 million. So they really beat it by like, you know, o over 10 times. They over 10x the, um, the offer. And then the plaintiff's attorney offered the defense a high low. He said, how about a low of 2 million and a high of 10 million? But the defense declined it and said, no, we'll do a low of 2 million since that's the offer and a high of 8 million. And so that was rejected by the plaintiff. So because of that, they're trying to save 2 million, right? Because of that, they got hit for 21 million and they have to pay a lot more. So um, this particular attorney, another attorney wrote the, I guess he interviewed the, um, this was one of the trial lawyers uh, list serves. I guess this other attorney that I also know, he probably interviewed the trial attorneys and then wrote up, a, he wrote up a long description, like a 12 page description. And he basically said that he feels in his opinion, he's a trial lawyer that's tried over a hundred cases. He, he feels the verdict is collectible. It's clean. It has a lot of prejudgment interest that's already owed. And it's a life changing generational uh, saving and changing victory for a single father and his two sons. So I hope this was helpful. I think that it has a lot of interesting concepts about how to approach the trial, about how to frame the issues, about how witnesses can be, about how plaintiff's attorneys can can be. And, you know, it's a great result, $21 million, but it is a very serious, life-changing injury. Let us know what you think and what questions you have. And please like and subscribe to our channel. And we are here for you. Okay, have a great day, everyone. Bye-bye.